Hey folks, and welcome to The Salty Mark. I appreciate you checking in here on my intro video. Uh, if you're coming from my old channel, The Salty Seaman, uh, the, uh, my Navy side stuff, which, you know, it's doing fairly well for itself. Uh, you, know, you might have noticed I do uh, quite a bit of, uh, when I'm not doing military, uh, pro wrestling seems to come up a lot. So I finally decided, or finally figured out what the hell I wanted to do. I always wanted to do wrestling stuff, and there's a billion wrestling channels, and everybody has this and that, you know, and you know all these news sites, you know, What Culture, and you know, Figure Four, Pro Wrestling Observer, you know, the Jim Cornette channel, and just tons and tons of stuff out there. It's like, how do I do my own thing? And, uh, you know, just today it just kind of dawned on me. It's like, you know, is there a breakdown of, you know, what wrestling is, what kayfabe is, you know, what, what are the different, uh, what does the terminology mean? You know, what does this mean? What does, uh, you know, what should this do, et cetera, et cetera. You know, basically, you know, trying to get a, a wrestling kayfabe 101 going, uh, you know, and I was like, I think that's a good idea, you know, and where should I start? You know, what, you know, what bit should I make, you know, my, my kickoff towards pro wrestling and like, you know, how to basically break it down, you know? So, and I thought, you know, the first thing to start with is the phrase kayfabe. And I think to uh, explore this phrase and what it means, uh, you know, th th it ties into giving a bit of a history lesson, which will help us start out the rest of the things we do. And we talk about what a bump is, you know, oh, what a uh, heel is, what a baby face is. And like we break all those little in things down individually and really give them, uh, you know, a lot of uh, due diligence. Now, if you're a pro wrestling fan of any kind of sort, I mean, I, who's on the internet, you know, more than likely you're going to have heard a lot of this stuff before, or at least the terms, but, uh, I hope not breaking down like I have as just an obsessive geek who just like absorbs everything. And, uh, you know, just knows a lot, uh, you know, the terminology, you know, basically what it means, but do you, do you know how it all comes together? And I think, you know, I, that that's what I'm going to try to do with this. My goal is to, you know, take each term, each uh, whatever, you know, piece of what, what wrestling is and, uh, you know, break it down and give it all its insights and uh, turn it back around and say, like, why this applies to what you watch as a wrestling fan. But, uh, yeah, the first one is a big one to tackle, unfortunately. It is a very, very uh, encompassing thing, and it is the uh, the hallmark, the benchmark, the backbone of what pro wrestling is and that's kayfabe so whether you know a little or whether you know a lot i'm going to break this down basically in the style of uh if i have to explain anything to a uh someone who doesn't know anything about wrestling you know someone who may be uh you know i mean obviously people who only know it by the general passing knowledge of what it is you know, whether or not, you know, hey, as a kid, you know, you sometimes watch WWF superstars for Hulk Hogan every once in a while. And you kind of remember that stuff. And you had a good time when you were a little kid. Maybe you've, uh, you know, ne you know, only seen it channel flipping by and saw a bunch of uh, muscular guys and uh, covered in oil and tights uh, throwing each other around. Uh, but uh, you overall is like, yeah, it was never a part of your life. And you really don't understand other than, oh, it's fake. It's this, it's that, uh, you know, definitely not your cup of tea. Or maybe it is kind of and you're just like, oh, I don't really know how this stuff works. So uh, for this, I'm going to just break it down uh, bit by bit and, uh, and, try to, and try to give a, a background understanding of all this stuff. And I think to understand what kayfabe is, and again, if you are uh, someone new, that, that word will mean nothing to you. You're like, what is kayfabe? Like, what? Like, it doesn't. It's nothing to me. Uh, but it does have a meaning, and it does explain a lot of what actually pro wrestling is and why it's so a unique uh, character in the uh, cultural landscape. So to break down kayfabe, you got to go back. 
I think, again, like I said, to a uh, historical background, you know, where did pro wrestling start? Why did it start? Was it ever real? You know, what did, are the questions like, what, what, why is, why is there all these weird terms? You know, if you stumble, you're a casual fan and stumble on it, people are talking in this weird language. Where did all this come from? And it all comes from the beginning. Now, pro wrestling is, uh, you know, started out as a legitimate competition. Uh, wrestling and various forms of grappling have been around, of course, for throughout human history, among other uh, various sports. And uh, basically by 19, the, the 1850s, 1860s, you know, the world community was starting to uh, coagulate uh, what pro, what wrestling is, what, you know, basic grappling wrestling was. And it basically broke them off into uh, separate camps. What was officially recognized as a uh, the official sport of wrestling was the styles known as uh, Greco-Roman and uh, freestyle. That's the same stuff you see in uh, the Olympics and college at, to this day. Unfortunately, the, the the decision to make that the official what we call wrestling left a section of wrestling out of in the cold. What is uh, colloquially known as a uh, catch wrestling, catch as catch can, or pro wrestling. Uh, essentially, uh, the official version, the uh, the amateur versions we know today, and, and I'll get to why one's called amateur and one's called pro wrestling. The amateur version it, it stuck to those rules. There's there's no joint locks, no submissions, no chokes. It's all about pins, and not you know any kind of. Uh, you know, further than that, just grappling to uh, pin your opponent down for a one-two. Uh, this that's, uh, this left out in the cold. Uh, this other uh, section of wrestling, which did include various joint locks, various submissions, various choke holds, and other fun shenanigans. And of course, the uh, the people who practiced that art were not very hard, not very happy to be left out in the cold. So they decided to uh, about in the eighteen sixties of France, which is about. Uh, as best as we can tell, uh, just decided to go on tour showing off their skills as like the real wrestling. Uh, why in the 1860s? Why in Europe? Why in the 1860s? Why in France? Well, we don't know for sure. Like that, that is that, that's, that's kind of the best guess. Everything in pro wrestling is a little murky when you go back that far, but that is the general given uh, reason, idea, uh, originate of where pro wrestling come from came from sorry so these uh these catch wrestlers as they were known people who could you know twist you into like legit pretzels choke you out in five seconds you know basically do it uh, these really really super tough guys said you know screw the uh the official system that's going end up going into colleges in the olympics you know we're going to show you what real wrestling is and they went on tour through europe you know doing real uh, matches and all that fun stuff uh, to uh, help them get along and, uh, you know, just seemed like a natural match. The traveling carnivals of the day, which were uh, pretty much uh, solidified by that time, you know, they, they hooked up with them. So the wrestlers hooked the, the pro wrestlers, the catch wrestlers, the submission wrestlers started traveling with a carnival. And, you know, the carnival is known for uh, even to this day, uh, you know, being a little on the shady side, it's showmanship, it's PT Barnum, the circuit, all that stuff. So you, you've got a bunch of, uh, you know, real legit athletes out here doing real legit things and they're traveling with, uh, you know, and, and they're, they're kind of getting by, not just showing off, you know, their skills and exhibitions, but, you know, the carnival eventually tucks them into, you know, basically the old you know, the, the famous wrestling challenge. Now, if, if, if you know anything about wrestling, you've probably seen Spider-Man, you know, the famous story, you know, Spider-Man gets his powers and he decides to go win this bet, you know, last three minutes with this, uh, you know, this wrestler. And that was absolutely true. And that was one of the draws for the wrestlers in the carnival, you know, was challenge, you know, was, you know, whoever there was their top toughest wrestler, um, you know, or, or even like a, a, a ringer of some sort, you know, have someone, you know, whoever the local tough man was, wherever they're traveling to, 
come challenge them and see if they could best, you know, the best wrestler of the uh, carnival circuit. So and that, 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 that was kind of their deal. It was like, hey, you know, you know, after they, you know, usually wipe the floor with any of these guys, you know, they say, hey, you know, you know, if you thought that was cool, come watch the wrestling matches. And, you know, 1860 to uh, the 1880s, this was kind of what was going on. And somewhere in there, and this is where it's completely vague and no one really knows, even the best of uh, wrestling historians, is when exactly this started to become, uh, you know, less and less real, should we say. I think, obviously, the uh, influence of the carnival or traveling with the uh, you know, kind of gave them the idea of like, why do we go out here and kill ourselves for real every night when we can go on and kind of fake it and make it look really, really real, but not hurt ourselves so much. But at the same time, you know, we're going to be real athletes and, you know, the, you know, the challenges are going to be for the most part real because these guys really do know their stuff. They really do know submission wrestling. They really are probably some of the toughest motherfuckers on earth. But hey, why kill ourselves in legit matches when we don't have to? We're not we're not in college, we're not in the Olympics. You know, so it 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 started the 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 lines between real and fake started to blend here. And that's definitely where the carnival takes hold. The carnival has its own language, its own terminology, its own culture and lifestyle, and that to this day is uh reflected in the culture of pro wrestling. That being, you know, the term carny, which I'm sure a lot of you, even if you're not pro wrestling fans, are, are aware of in the term and the reputation carnies have and, you know, the idea that they have their own kind of uh, speak. They kind of have their own uh, way of st- way of life and they have their own way of, uh, you know, co- of course, conning people, you know, out of various things. Yeah, that was completely true. So this is, uh, you know, we can start talking about what the word kayfabe means a little here. Because the the carnival language is essentially kind of sideways pig Latin. If you are a fan of the uh, hip-hop rapper Snoop Dogg, you know, for shizzle, my nizzle, he throws, he kind of like takes words, turns them sideways and throws some Z's in there. That is straight carny. That is exactly how they talk. It is a, a very weird pigeon form of pig Latin uh, it's that they could communicate and not get the uh, marks, uh, let them know what's going on, essentially. A mark being uh, a person to be taken advantage of, which I'm sure also another universal term, but that also comes from the carnivals and the circuses. You're a mark, you're a person we're going to take money from and show them something you know, spectacular that may not be on the up and up. So you take the word fake and you turn it inside out and you, you throw some uh, buttons and whistles on it and you got the word kayfabe. And kayfabe was a term used by them for, you know, this is protecting their business. The, 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 most, the most important part of it was to make sure the marks didn't know if you were fooling them. So while you're trying not to fool them, you will engage in kayfabe. Whenever there's a mark around, you treat it as it's absolutely real. Uh, when there's anything going on in the ring that's not on the up and up, that's not a shoot, another term, which means you know it really happened in pro wrestling parlance, you're keeping kayfabe. You're keeping the idea that it was not real, that it was fake, from the average person. And that is essentially where pro wrestling uh, uh, started uh, its beginning building blocks to be a completely uh, not on the up and up sport. And, you know, you might be warning, I'm kind of withdrawing myself from saying fake because, you know, it's not a term they like, even though they know it's like, obviously it's not real. They're carnies. They're out, they're out to fleece marks, but they really take offense to the word fake because gravity is not fake and injuries are not fake and doing this shit all the time over and over again uh, is not fake. And, uh, you know, predetermined is probably a better word. But, yeah, it's, it's – but the fake part is it's straight from carny times. It's straight up uh, we are trying to fool people into convincing them they're seeing something that's not what it seems to be. 
Now, by the late 1880s, uh, you know, this, you know, started to become less and less of a secret and people started getting suspicious. But at the same time, um, you know, it, it became a huge sport. Uh, not, it, it transferred out of Europe into America where it really, really hit its stride in those carnivals. You know, and a few, uh, you know, legit tough guy shooters, you know, names you might have heard. Farmer Burns, Gotch, Hackenschmidt. Uh, these were very, very famous wrestlers of the day. They were legit tough wrestlers who guys who would tie you in knots and make you scream, scream for your mother. But, uh, you know, how much of the action going on at this point was real? How much of it was fake is always up for debate, but historians kind of say around 1890, except for the occasional title match and not all of them, but some of them when, when they decided to create world champions and whatnot, those would be the only ones that would be defended for real. And everybody else would just be trying to, uh, work what they call snugly and stiffly and make it look absolutely as real as possible, but still have a, you know, which included a lot of real work, but with the knowledge of, you know, at the end, we're going to go a certain way. One guy is going to go over, as they say, these are all terms I will get to individually in the, uh, in the series. So by this point, you know, the, 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 this sport grew so huge in America. It was, at one point, probably the second biggest uh, sport in America behind probably baseball, even outshadowing boxing for a while. And, you know, one of the killers of it was in the early 1900s was, you know, uh, between two, uh, you know, I think it was Gotch and Hackenschmidt, Hackenschmidt, uh, you know, their first match, uh, which was, you know, generally considered legitimate, went over an hour. But the rematch, uh, you know, the outcome was the same, but it ended in 23 minutes or whatnot, and the fans didn't buy it. You know, and, uh, you know, the, the, of course, excuse was given. I think one of them was that the person who lost was injured uh, so that they couldn't go, you know, that, that, that's why they lost so quick. And, you know, which is a legitimate excuse. I mean, we, we have UFC MMA today. You know, matches can end in a, in a flash. But back then, it was like, no, this is, you know, this is obviously bullshit. So that, that kind of hurt it. And it started, you know, and then it started, slowly started tapering off. And then, you know, by the 1930s, you know, exposés are being written. People were exposing the business to different degrees, you know, and, and business died in certain areas. But, you know, news didn't travel like it did today. And, you know, and time heals all wounds, you know, uh, you know, through the, uh, you know, 1930s wrestling really, really started to just dive bomb, you know, and, and all, the, all the exposés, you know, in certain areas just kind of exposing it. But it still kind of lived in other areas. People didn't kind of get the message or they honestly just didn't care. You know, they were willing to suspend their disbelief and enjoy the kayfabe. You know, they did not, you know, they were not interested in it and others just didn't believe it. Or they just never heard about it. And, uh, you know, this would lead to a very, very dark time for pro wrestling in the 30s. And then, you know, World War II happened. And, of course, how much wrestling can you do? Because most of the wrestlers are out fighting the war. And uh, But all that would change post-World War II. Uh, and a lot, a lot. I'm, I'm very, very shortening. And then there's a whole story about how territories were created. Uh, you, know, you know, where the business came out of, uh, you know, all these exposés and court documents and people exposing it and how they still managed to put it together and thrive, especially with the, in the advent of television, which is one of pro wrestling's biggest breaks and which helped it catapult it into a mainstream uh, part of American culture and elsewhere, Japan, the UK, uh, and other places, uh, to lesser degrees. And they would create territory systems throughout, uh, the country, uh, you know, and it would thrive. It would it would bloom and blossom and become part of the landscape, and remain kind of virtually unchanged until uh, the 1980s. And you know, obviously, you know, they update for the times, and there's various other things in, but at the all time, you know, the main thing was, despite at this point, a lot of you know, it, it was 
partially, I don't want to say it's completely niche, but it wasn't as big as it was. And there was definitely, you know, from, you know, pretty much most of the 20th century, most people either, you know, didn't believe it was real or were highly suspicious that it wasn't. And, uh, you know, and the fans of it either were, you know, completely oblivious and refused to believe it, or they kind of knew something was going on. You know, they understood that there was some kayfabe happening there, but they, they were, they're kind of willing to let it go. They say, well, yeah, some of it isn't real, but you know, the, the title matches are real with, with the time, what, you know, a hundred, you know, a hundred years ago was true. But, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, the fans believed what they wanted to believe. And, you know, that's the magic of the circus. That's the magic of the carnival. That's the magic of kayfabe. You want to get them in that mindset of, I want to believe this is real. Get me in the moment. Get me into it. And that's what kayfabe is supposed to do. It's not just about keeping the secret. It's not just about fleecing the marks. It's about the art of what you're doing and keeping it real enough and believable enough that the fans who may have many, many doubts can lose themselves in and just have fun. And at the end of the day, that what that is what kayfabe is to a lot of degree. I'm sure people actually in the business have done it for years can correct me on a lot of stuff and uh, uh, provide a lot more details. But I think this is a very good uh, breakdown of uh, what kayfabe is and what it means and why it's important to the sport and why it's the foundation of everything else I'm going to talk about here. Now that's about all I got for right now. Uh, you know, next uh, uh, session, uh, I don't know quite what I'm going to talk about yet, but uh, you know, I'll continue trying to uh, break these term these terms down and what what each thing means. Try to give it a little more history background. Uh, we'll talk about the Fall Guys. Uh, you know, the history of the WWF and Titan Sports uh, slash WWE Inc. And that all goes back to the 30s and is part of a, a big part of it. And uh, fun stuff like that, little tales from uh, different things, just giving examples. But uh, I, you know, I think this is a good start. Uh, you know, I might do a second bit on kayfabe first if uh, you know I think of some more stuff I haven't covered here. Anyways, this is the salty mark. This is the intro. Vi- this is the intro video. Hope you guys liked it. I hope if uh, if you did think it was cool and you'd like to hear more, you share this with your friends. Like and subscribe, brand new channel, can always use the help. Uh, or if not, if you just listen in and you enjoyed it, just tell me, hey, I enjoyed it in the comments, or just enjoy it by yourself. I don't care. I just hope somebody enjoyed this stuff, because I had fun making it. So, talk to you freaks later. Peace. Peace.